Shalom. Today we're going to cover two more letters, a combination, and see what we find. You can still get a font chart if you click the link below. So the two letters we're looking at today are Samich and Pei. And Pei has two forms, you remember. They both have that little dangle hanging down from the front. The regular Pei fits on the line, and the final Pei extends down below the line. So these two letters spell a word which is saf, which means basin or threshold. Exodus 12:22, And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until morning. A little Passover's instruction. Judges 19:27. And her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to his way. And behold, the woman his concubine was fallen down at the door of the house and her hands were upon the threshold. Uh, maybe the most gruesome chapter in the Bible. Also the concept of a door. Esther 2.21 In those days while Mordechai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Bictan and Teresh, of those which kept the door were wroth and sought to lay hand on King Ahasuerus. Zechariah 12.2 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. So a cup and a basin are similar to a threshold in that the lip or the rim of the cup is like a threshold. So from this we have a geminate verb. We've talked about those elsewhere where the last two letters are the same. The verb only appears once. It's in the Hitpa'el for those of, of you that are familiar with your binyanim. Psalm 84.10 For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. So related to door. Another related word we're going to see is sof, which means the end. Ecclesiastes 3.11 He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Joel 2.20 But I will remove far off from you the northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea, and his hinder part toward the utmost sea, and his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he hath done great things. So something towards the end, something towards the rear. If you think about a threshold, it's a place where one zone, one area ends, and something new begins. So I have done a presentation on the name Joseph, Yosef, which comes from this root also. And uh, I'll put the link to that. But what happens when you come to the end, if you want to keep going, then you have to do it some more, and you have to do it again, and you have to continue. Job 27.1. Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, Psalm 115.14. Yehovah shall increase you more and more, you and your children. So you remember when Joseph was being born, she said, oh, may God continue to add to me. Another related root we have here is asaf, which means to gather or to be together. Genesis 6, 21. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Speaking to Noah, getting on the ark. Nehemiah 9, 1. Now in the twenty and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloth and earth upon them. They were all together. They gathered together. Now here is a, a cute word with the same basic root. We have talked before about reduplicative syllables where things appear twice, similar to geminates, but here the whole phoneme repeats twice, asaf suf. And this is only used one place, Numbers 11.4. 4. 
and the mixed multitude that was among them felt a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? So that's because they were gathered together. Now you might know already the traditional term for the mixed multitude, Erev Rav, which I printed there for you, uh, which is used in Exodus 12:38. And a mixed multitude went up also with them, and, and flocks and herds, even very much cattle. And no, it doesn't have anything to do with the way mixed is spelt. They're just a bit two different concepts. The people that were gathered, gathered together, or Erev Rav really is more like the mixed multitude. So we see at the end of the dispensation as Yeshua was coming he comes to gather Luke 19 10 for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost John eleven fifty two, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad and of course at the end in Matthew 24 31 and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. This root also gives us a chance to talk about Yam Suf, which is traditionally translated as the Red Sea. But Suf doesn't mean red, it means reed. So you can see in Exodus 2.5, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. And her maidens walking along by the river's side, when she saw the ark, that is with Moses in it, among the flags, the flags are reeds, she sent her maid to fetch it. So suf actually means reed. So the question is, why in Exodus 10, 19, is it translated as red? And Yehovah turned a mighty strong west wind, which took away the locusts, and cast them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the coasts of Egypt. So for a long time I thought this confusion had something to do with the lack of spelling in English until maybe the 1800s, but we're going to see that that, that, that is not the case. The red tide is something that is well known. It is called caused by an algae bloom and apparently the Red Sea is subject to this problem. Most of the discussions about the Red Sea or the Reed Sea have to do with where people think the crossing took place. So even in the Septuagint translation which was done in 285 BCE we see that it says Red Sea. Erythran Thalassan and also in the Greek New Testament, Acts 7.36, you can see it's the same word, Erythra Thalassa. It just has to do, the endings have to do with the position in the sentence. And when the Vulgate was translated, put into Latin in the 4th century, it was also translated as Red Sea. So that area has been known as the Red Sea for a long time. Now going back to 1382 with Wycliffe's translation, you can see the locusts are being cast, casted, cast into the Reed Sea. So my thought was, oh, it used to be the Reed Sea and now it's the Red Sea. But if you look even in uh, his, his translation of Genesis 25, 25, and they're talking about when Esau was born, he was, came out Reed. So that's how they used to spell red. Tyndale also, 1534, is using the idea of the Red Sea spelled like reed. The first evidence I find of it being translated as Reed Sea is by Luther, and this is of course German. He writes Schilfmeer, and Schilf are reeds. So he did use that translation. Going into the Geneva Bible in 1599, it became very established to be the Red Sea. It's that particular body of water that we call the Red Sea. Now, this discussion would not be complete without comparing the cognate word of 
Saf using the Sin instead of the Samech. Originally we looked at Samech, now we're looking at Sin. So this is the shape for this letter and we've gone over it a lot. Remember the Shin with the dot on the right is the Shin. The dot on the left is Sin and it seems like there was a lot of shuffling back and forth between the Samech and the Sin. How can you remember where the dot is? It's on the left for the sin because sin is never right. Not my joke. So when we look at the word safa, we find that it's a lip or the bank of a body of water or a language. And you can see how it would go from lips to language. Exodus 6.12 And Moses spake before Jehovah, saying, Behold, the children of Israel have not hearkened unto me. How then shall Pharaoh hear me? who am of uncircumcised lips. Genesis 11, 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Also the seashore. Genesis 22, 17. That in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. In Exodus 26.10, And thou shalt make fifty loops on the edge of one curtain, talking about building the Mishkan, that is outmost on the coupling, and fifty loops in the edge of the curtain which coupleth the second. So again, we have this idea of a brim or an edge. Your lips also are the same, right? Here is one more citation where it is talking about the high priest's robe. Exodus 39:23, and there was a hole in the midst of the robe as a hole of a haberdam with a band around the hole that it should not rend. So all this concept, whether sin or samich of saf, is about the edge of something coming to the end of something, a threshold of something. They're all similar concepts regardless of the spelling. We'll look at one more related word, safam, which means upper lip. Leviticus 13.45 And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent, and his head bare, and he shall put a covering upon his upper lip, and shall cry, unclean, unclean. Also in Second Samuel 19.24 And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king, and had neither dressed his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came again in peace. And so this word comes to us in modern Hebrew, safam. It means mustache. I pray this was edifying to you. Until next time, tasimita inayim al-hashamayim. Put your eyes on the sky. Your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.